Thank you, Caleb. Okay, welcome everyone. Um, if somebody wants to go and let people know in the living room, in the kitchen, and wherever else, I know a lot of people get back there talking. We want to get going here. And as you're coming in, if you could move as close to the front as possible, if you're normally here, just so as people do come in and they, they look around and they go, where, where, where can I sit? It's just helpful if those of us that are here regularly can get up closer to the front so people that maybe come in for the first time feel like they can grab a spot. Thank you. A um, couple things that are coming up here that you know about, and, and I just want to keep this in front of us. We need help with our monthly family meal time that we do during our Global Bridegroom Fast. It's coming up in February. It'll be on February 7th. We have some signups here for some desserts already, uh, soups and salads, and only one main dish. So we need some folks in the room tonight that are going to be a part of that evening on February 7th because we do our prayer meeting at 6 and then we have family time together where we have a meal together and we have testimonies of what the Lord's doing in our lives and we get to celebrate what Jesus is doing and rejoice and celebrate one another. But we like to have a little meal around that. Even though we're in, it's three days of fasting, we break our fast to feast in the evening together. So as usual, I'm going to pass this clipboard around and I'm going to start on this side but please wherever it lands make sure it gets to the other side please sometimes a clipboard only makes it on one side and we do need some help we need another main dish or a super salad Josh so if you got you know your favorite uh, you know main dish that you want to cook up for us and bring that would be awesome anyway if you could pass that around that'd be great uh, just a couple announcements and then we're going to jump into uh, some teaching tonight and I'm continuing with the prophetic history Last night, we had our first information meeting for our Forerunner internship, our 12-week internship, and I know there are a lot of you that came to that, and I just want to encourage you, if you're interested in our 12-week internship, many people have gone through it. I think we've graduated 60-some people out of our internships since we started them, which is pretty amazing, and we're just excited to offer another one. We'll be having another information meeting about that on Saturday, January 29th at 10 in the morning. So if you missed last night, or if you came to last night, you've got more questions and you want to just see if the Lord's directing you that way, join us on Saturday, January 29th at 10 in the morning here in the living room area. And then immediately following that, I've been talking about our Forerunner Equipping, which is for those that have already gone through our internship. Last night was our information meeting on that as well. We had about 15 people there that are interested in doing that. What we do, that's a deeper dive. If you can think of that term, it's a deeper dive into the messages that you get during the 12 weeks. And so we're going to have an information meeting about that as well on January, Saturday, January 29th, immediately following our internship meeting. So if you're interested in those two things, please join us for that. Good. On uh, next Thursday night, January 27th, we'll be celebrating. I've been calling it our three-year. It's our two-year anniversary. <laughs> We're going into our third year. The reason I keep saying it's two years is because we came in here in October 2019. And we were meeting together on Thursday nights. A lot of us, some of us were in the room together, many of us not. But we were, here to, we were here on Thursday nights during 2019, but we didn't dedicate the room for night and day prayer until January 2020. And so we're actually coming on celebrating two years. And so next week, we're going to mark that together here during our Encounter God service, Thursday night, regular time. So make sure you're with us for that evening as well. Uh, the other thing I want to let you know about is another thing we're celebrating is it's going to be a year that we started our night watch that we do that starts that goes tonight till two in the morning and then tomorrow night until midnight. And so we've had a couple of, of times over the last year where we've extended our times and had night watch um, intensives. Sorry, there, there it is. Um, and this is really this next one that we're going to do on February 18th, Friday night. 
is going to be a night watch celebration just to thank the Lord, mark that night, but also it's an opportunity to get the word out to people that are interested in giving the Lord the night watch. And there's a lot of people that are being stirred about giving their time to the Lord in the night watch, which is really the night watch is anywhere from 10 p.m. till 6 in the morning. It's kind of the traditional night watch in, in a sense, you know, the watches of the Lord. And so our desire that eventually that we would offer the night watch every night of the week from midnight to 6. And so we're just striking the ground right now tonight as we stay open until 2 in the morning. And then on Friday night, tomorrow night, as we're open from 7 p.m. till midnight. And we're, we're just so grateful for all of you that have been so faithful to that over the last year. It's just really incredible what the Lord's doing. And again, we're just so grateful for everyone's commitment to that and saying yes to that and allowing the Lord to build the night. The night belongs to Jesus. It doesn't belong to the enemy. It doesn't belong to man. The night is for God. And one of the ways that we can express that is giving him adoration in the middle of the night. And as well as for us older adults being able to do that, it's beautiful. But I think it even speaks even louder to a generation of young people where there's young people in this room adoring Jesus in the middle of the night while their generation is out doing the works of sin, in a sense. That's happening in the night, in the, in the night watches. And yet when there's a generation that decides, I'm going a different direction to give Jesus, to offer to fast sleep, because that's what you're doing in the night watch. Yeah. You're fasting your sleep. And it's, it's, sometimes when you're younger, it's easier to do. You guys can like, like I leave here at midnight tonight, and I know some of you are, have been here till one or two, and you're texting me like at seven in the morning. I'm like, what are you even doing up right now? It's just amazing to me. I'm bouncing around here. I'm good until about midnight. And then if you see me, I'm bumping into the walls in the back. I'm just, I'm like, I got to get home. But I think it's so great that we're able to offer Jesus that in this house and we're only two years into this, you guys, and the Lord's already helping us to give him the night. And Alicia's been so faithful to lead that. Alicia, thank you for taking the lead on that. Grateful for that as well. So February 18th, at we're going to officially start that at 10 o'clock. I'll do a teaching on the theology of the night. Like there's Bible verses on the night watch. It's not just, hey, it's a fun time. Bring your pillow. Let's have pizza. No, those days are over. Like that's, I guess that's fun to do, but we're not here to go, hey, let's go have pizza and then we're going to go bowling and then we're going to come back and run around the church. Those days are over. We're going to stand watch before the Lord. We have, yes, we have snacks in the back and Cheez-Its and stuff. It's just good night watch food. But the Lord is giving us permission to offer him the night. And so again, it's just so encouraging. Amen. All right. Let's jump into the teaching tonight, and then we're going to go into some worship. If you need notes, you want to hold notes in your hand, they're right outside the door. If you want to take a moment and go grab them, please do so. Or if you want to get them on your, on your smartphone, your mobile device, you can pull them up at thehops.org. As usual, they're under this week's teachings. And tonight, I'm doing prophetic history number three. And um, talking about courage to move forward with God. And I... The reason I'm sharing this prophetic history, it's been about a year and a half since I've shared the stories. I've shared them in certain groups, maybe in different settings from time to time. But it's important to me to share this. It, it, it really is important to me to get this storyline out, not just for me so I stay signed up. It's important that you hear this story because your story with God lines up with my story. It's a little different, but it's all kind of the same because I'm talking with people after I share some of these stories that are personal to me, but I'm talking with people and they're like, hey, the Lord did this with me. I've got to go back and listen to this thing that the Lord spoke to me about, this thing I wrote in my journal because we all have a story that's colliding together because the Lord's writing a story that we're all a part of. We're all a part of it. A lot of times we hear stories and we're like, well, I don't have anything exciting happen like that. And it's not so much that they have to be super exciting with angels and all these things because most of my story is not around that stuff. I have a few of those things. Most of the time, it's just God's faithfulness to us. And when he speaks things, he wants us to remember those so that we stay in the fight. And so one of the reasons that I'm sharing it again, and I'm, I'm really 
very delayed in sharing this information is because the human heart is forgetful. So let's pray, and we're going to jump into it here. Father, I thank you for the history that you're writing in all of our lives. Lord, I thank you for every person's history in this room that has said yes to you, no matter what their age, no matter what their experience, their history, their past, their future. I thank you, Father, for the activity of your Holy Spirit. I thank you that there's prophetic history in this room for every person. I thank you for the storyline that you're writing that somehow we all got in this room together, Lord, and it's, it's bigger than we realize. It's not just a service. There's something bigger that's happening here that really is bigger than us in our own story. We're all colliding together for such a time as this. Open our hearts, open our minds, open our spirits to you tonight. Have your way in our hearts. Let us leave here strengthened and encouraged to run with you fully in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 78, verses 4 through 7. I paraphrase this. I cut it down a little bit just for the sake of the notes. But what the psalmist is saying is we need to tell the next generation to come the story that God's writing in our lives. My children need to hear my story. My grandchildren are going to need to hear the story of God in my life. We need to tell the story over and over and over again because that's what the human heart needs because, as I just mentioned, we are forgetful as human beings. Again, I say this often, but every 28 days, we have to be reminded of the thing that we said yes to 28 days ago because there's things that come up in our life that bump us around. We collide with pressures and circumstances And the Lord says, you must remember the story that I'm saying because you're too weak to make it on your own just on being inspired a month ago. It's not that we have to go keep getting inspired. It means we have to feed ourselves on the storyline of God and what he's doing in our personal lives and then what he's doing with us corporately. So that's why I'm telling this, and that's why it's important to me. That's why I make these these little, I say these little things. I'm saying this. Yes to you, but I'm saying this to angels and devils as well in the spiritual atmosphere because the Lord has planted a flag here in this place, and we are doing something in the place of prayer that is so aggressive when you think about it. In this little room, we're offering the Lord 35 hours of worship and prayer a week. That's an aggressive prayer meeting, 35 hours of prayer a week in just two and a half years. That's a very aggressive prayer meeting. And you're like, well, that's a lot of prayer meetings. So I think of it as one prayer meeting as we do it together. That's an aggressive, it's rigorous, it's hard on our flesh. We have to rearrange our schedules, which all of you have done. You've had to cooperate with the grace of God to get into the, into the purposes of God for your life here and how you feel connected to this place. Whether you understand it all or not is is not irrelevant, but we don't always understand it when we first come in this room. We're like, who are these people? What's that guy saying? Why? What's going on? What is this? What is that? But it, somehow it resonates in my heart of something that Jesus is doing in the earth, and that's how we're all here in this room, and, and that's how we get connected this, to this storyline. Well, very quickly, I just want to do a quick review. If we don't remember what God's doing, we get fearful we get wrong mindsets, we get discouraged, and that's when we make bad decisions as human beings. The most well-intended person that loves Jesus, under discouragement, in the place of fear, in the place of a wrong mindset, we will make the wrong choice because we don't have our equilibrium in Jesus. We've heard something We've taken a stand. The enemies come to challenge us in it in an area, and we're not quite sure what happened. And then we begin to doubt everything, and unbelief sets in. That's when we make bad choices, and that's when we veer off from what God's telling us to do. It's very rare that God tells you 10 things to do because you'll never keep up with it. I remember when I was a very young man, my early 20s, I remember one of the things I learned, and you've probably heard this as well, when I was always being challenged, Lord, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? Somebody said to me, are you doing the last thing that God asked you to do? And if I was honest, I had to say, well, that's not very exciting. I've been doing that for three months. The Lord's like, you have very low perseverance. Wow, you're addicted to way too many other things than me if I need to be changing gears for you every three months. The Lord's looking for a people that run with a marathon pace. He's not looking for sprinters. 
He's not looking for people that run a sprint race. It's impressive for a moment to run a sprint. We go, wow, look how fast they are. But when you watch somebody run a marathon with God, when I watch the Olympics, the Summer Olympics, and I watch people run 26 miles, I'm like, how do they do that? How do they come around that corner into that stadium at the end, man? That's amazing because they paced themselves because they knew why they were running. They knew why they were running. Not that being a sprinter is, is less than that, but that marathon pace is what, how Jesus wants us to set our life. And with that means he's not probably going to change the assignment in three months. You might do something here or there. He's going to call you to something long-term that you do with people corporately so your heart stays engaged long-term in this thing. It doesn't mean that you never get to leave a place or that you always have to be in one location doing this thing, but it means setting your heart in a way. Night and day prayer is a global expression that we're a part of. This is not just something that's happening here. This isn't a man's idea. This, I say it many times, it's not cool, it's not trendy, it's not, hey, let's try this and see if this, this gets something going. Maybe we'll get some people excited around this thing. No, you know if you've been around here for three months, it loses its excitement pretty quick. You're wondering, is there something else I should be doing? Is this really valid in God? Maybe I should be doing something else. Surely he can't want me just to sit in this room and look at him all the time and just sing songs about him. And we come up with all these conclusions because actually we're illiterate in the Bible verses about this room. I am. The body of Christ, we have some illiteracy around what it means to sit before God and to sing his word back to him and do what we do in this room. We're not, we don't have full comprehension of that because we haven't talked about it very much. And for his purposes... But right now, as his hand is at the door and he's preparing the earth for all that we're going through, he's raising up people and he's putting it on our radar to go, hey, I want you to connect to this group or that group that's doing this. We're a part of a global expression. There's been a shift even in the body of Christ. And the Lord said in Malachi chapter 1, verse 11, he says, there is going to be incense that's going to go up from every city of the earth in Malachi 1, 11, night and day. He says, my name will be great in every city of the earth. And so he broadened this perspective of night and day prayer and worship and Malachi 1.11 saying it's going to take front and center stage in the church before Jesus returns. Night and day prayer and worship, Malachi 1.11. Through that, he's going to change how we understand Christianity, how unbelievers understand Christianity, how you and I as believers express our life together. Number three, there's a setting of the Lord in this thing. I, I mentioned that last week, and very quickly, I'm just going to highlight three stories of mine very quickly because I've got some others tonight, some new ones, and some you've heard, but a little new. The setting of the Lord means having prophetic encounters to understand who he is, and so I talked about a few last week for myself, and I want to highlight, highlight them again very quickly. I talked about a time in, when I was a young man, early 20s. Now I'm going way back, 1987. <clears throat> Some of you are like, what year was that? You know, 1987, the Lord spoke to uh, a friend of mine who was an intercessor, and he comes to me and he says, hey, I was praying for you the, the other day, Jim. And again, I was 19 years old, 1987, yeah, somewhere, 18, 19 years old, trying to serve Jesus, uh, when I say trying, it means my heart was committed to him, but I had just sin issues. I was dealing with things in my heart, and, and he was praying for me, and he comes up to me, and he says, the Lord spoke this phrase to my heart over you, that Jim is mine, and he's a gem. He belongs to me. Well, I didn't know that, even what, how to connect that at first. I kind of went like this. I'm 19 years old. Nobody ever, like, prayed prophetically over me. I just went, cool. And that's, that was my thing. I'm like, I got a prophetic word. I was like, wow, the Lord talked to you about me? That kind of freaked me out, first of all. Like somebody came up to me and said, hey, the Lord talked to me about you. I'm like, is that allowed? Are we, is that a, is, are we allowed to have, talk that way to each other, you know? Well, I found out that, yes, that does happen. And so what, as I sat with that over time, the Lord began to make it clear to my heart. He goes, that's the message of knowing me as a bridegroom God. 
In other words, understanding that the Lord delights in me, in my weakness. That was very important for what I'm doing now and what I've been doing the last 15 years and even my years of doing pastoral ministry and, and being a, a, a husband and being a father of recognizing how God relates to me in my weakness. He's tender toward me as a bridegroom God. And that's the language of Isaiah 62. And if you read through Isaiah 62, it says God will not be silent until there's night and day prayer going up. But one of the key points of night and day prayer is that those people will understand God as a tender bridegroom who has deep affections for us in our weakness. Because one of the things that happens to us as we spend more time with Jesus face to face with him, and what I mean by that, not literally seeing him face to face, but when you sit in a chair like this or in your room and you're disciplined and consistent in your prayer time with God, we realize we don't have as much going on with God as we thought we did. Because we're discovering who he is. We're discovering, who am I really dealing with here? It really is an Isaiah, woe is me moment, because we realize that a lot of the things we thought we had going on, the Lord's like, you're kind of cute, but there's a whole lot more that's going on here. And at times, that can make us fearful. It makes us full of anxiety. It makes us wonder, how does God really feel about us? And so as we're dialoguing with him, and as we're being called to pursue him, in, a, in an intentional, maybe even an intense way through prayer and fasting, we have to know how he feels and thinks about us. Look, you're looking at a guy who has blown a ton of fasts. I am so weak. And you're looking at a guy who, like, if I could find sunflower seeds during a fast, I will make a meal out of sunflower seeds. I literally, I'm like, are those sunflower seeds over there? Give me those sunflower seeds. And I will just eat handfuls of them. And like some people tell me, they're like, hey, I'm going on this fast and it's this, uh, I'm going on this uh, Daniel fast. So there's like no, uh, you know, stuff like I'm not going to eat steak and I'm not going to eat candy and ice cream and all that stuff. So, but my, I'm going to eat like vegan pasta. That's just vegetable pasta with cheese, right? I'm like, there's no way I could do that. That's like, to me, that's like eating a steak dinner. People are like, oh, I'm, I'm not eating hamburgers. I'm eating peanut butter and jelly. Do you know how great of a peanut butter and jelly sandwich I can make? If I'm not eating a hamburger, that's going to be like eating prime rib to me, you know? Why? Because my flesh is screaming for satisfaction. So you're looking at a guy who knows how to really do fasting bad and wrong and, and blow it right in the middle. But what I've learned in that, because I'm relating to a bridegroom with tenderness, he says, push delete that you just went and had the milkshake today. And let's start over because I really like you. I like that you're trying. So we don't always live with that. We live with under the pressure of not doing it as well as somebody else, as this person who seems super anointed because they got this going on in their life. And the Lord's like, I want you to relate to me as a tender bridegroom. Secondly, 2003, the Lord speaks to me about this forerunner messenger and being a messenger that would actually stare at Jesus and then speak of his beauty and also give be a preacher and a messenger that would bring comfort and clarity to people when God, the activity of God is not going the way we thought it would go. Because we're headed into that day, you guys. The church is headed into a day where God is going to do things on the earth that we don't believe he is supposed to do. And it's going to offend the church. It's going to be offensive to the body of Christ, some of these things that God does and that he doesn't do. Because we haven't talked about him. But it all goes back to a knowledge of God issue of who we believe he really is. I'm reading through with many of you right now. We're shredding through the Bible. A lot of us are like 30 days, right? We're just hitting it thing hard. We're like just shredding the Bible, just going through it, right? Well, I'm making my way through the book of Jeremiah, and I'm in this phrase. Again, you're going through it so fast. You're not reading it for a lot of comprehension. You're just getting it in your spirit and like, Holy Spirit, help me. But I kept hitting this phrase in Jeremiah. It says, the Lord says, I'm going to do this, Israel. I'm going to do this. I'm, and it's all this stuff like, oh, my gosh, what are you doing, Lord? Don't do that stuff. Don't do that. Don't do that. And he says, I'm doing it so you know that I am the Lord. I am the Lord. I am the Lord. I am the Lord. It's almost as if he says, I want people to know who I am. But a lot of us are, us people, we're like, no, we don't want the Lord to be that way. So what's he going to do? He's going to raise up forerunners or messengers that know him as a tender bridegroom, 
that go deep in the Bible verses, more than just a little bit of a revival over here and a little bit of touch of God over here, but we understand how God moves in the midst of his people and his activities on the earth. So when somebody comes to you and they go, I don't understand why God's doing this right now in my life. I've done A, B, and C, and I don't understand why it's not adding up. And we speak tenderly in the kindness of Jesus, and we break open Bible verses that releases a spirit of revelation on a person's heart and mind so they get into agreement with God and they actually live out the purposes of God and see it and they esteem it and they're satisfied in that because they're growing in the knowledge of who Jesus is and they're not just being a told a message to get them to next service. We live from service to service so often. The Lord wants us empowered on our inner man with the knowledge of who he is, and that requires messengers being raised up who gaze at Jesus, who are in conversation. We don't do it on the run. You gaze at him. You stare at him. That's why I had that experience where I was answering this call in Kansas City, and my hand was going to my mouth, and I would pull my hand away. I would say, Lord, what's going on right now? I was in full uh, charge of my body. I wasn't out of control. I was like, why is my hand going over my mouth and I'm pulling it away? And the Lord spoke to me. He says, because you're going to look at me and you're going to be stunned by what you see by my beauty. You're going to put your hand over your mouth because you're shocked by who I am, by the person that I am. And then I want you to take your mouth away and I want you to declare who I am and bring clarity. God's raising up messengers like that in the earth right now. You that are saying yes to look at Jesus, to wrestle with your flesh. It doesn't come easy. There's no way that God's going to give us things when we're frivolous about his things. I'm just be honest. If we love our sleep more, if we love our diets more, if we love our money more, if we love our relationships more, if we love everything more than we love him, we're not going to get in line with him on these things. As if we're not going to lose out on any of those things, though, either. I guarantee if you decide to live a fasted life, you're never going to miss out on enjoying food. If you really line your lives up in your relationship with Jesus, you are going to have the most fulfilling friendships and relationships because he designed them to be that way. It's when we're idolatrous and bent toward those things that we're dissatisfied and we need more of them to keep us going. And he wants to free our hearts and our souls from those things so that we can become in more in agreement with him. The last thing is this, night and day prayer in the spirit of David's tabernacle, Acts 15 and Revelation 5. Very quickly, I'm not going to go through it, but just to highlight, that's the dream I had following Mike Bickle in the Red Ford Courier truck, and I follow him into a church parking lot. We get into the church, and where do we go? We go to the basement of the church where there was an intercessory prayer meeting being led with worship, Young and old alike were engaged together. I remember being young people there, but because Mike and I were in the room, I figured we're the old guys in the room. So there's, a, there's a merging together of the generations in this thing that must take place. But I remember going, the place of prayer was not on the platform. It was in the basement. What does that mean? It was hidden. We have to be comfortable with hiddenness in God. Much of what we're going to do in our life with Jesus will be hidden. But we have to understand that he rewards that greatly. He values hiddenness. And often the place of prayer, the place of fasting, not a lot of bells and whistles. It's a place of hiddenness. But that's where things are executed in the spirit as a faithful people stand before him. Number four, I began to start paying attention to what God was doing up in this region in my history. And so I just quickly just want to just uh, highlight a, a couple of things here about the Roseville House of Prayer that began 99 and 2000. The Lord just began to stir up this region. Matt and Alicia Trask were a part of that. Some of you were a part of those early days that are in the room and Nick and Diane Parnell. And I told the story last week. How many remember the story about Mike Grant calling me from heaven? Everybody remember that story? Isn't that fascinating? That's fascinating. I was telling the story on Saturday at our leader meeting and somebody went, was Mike calling you from Missouri? I go, no, he was calling me from heaven because he died five years earlier. And my phone rings, and it's Mike Grant calling Leslie and I when we're driving up here to decide if we're moving to the Sacramento area to start this house of prayer. And as we were actually contemplating, do we make the move? And as we're driving up right, I'll never forget it, right through Vacaville, Highway 80, 
I look down at my phone, Mike Grant. I'm like, that's incredible. Leslie goes, I have goosebumps right now. I said, I'm not answering the phone. And you guys know the, the reason why. I just, I didn't want to answer it and have it be Joe's plumbing. <laughs> Would that be such a letdown? Because that's what happens after your number goes for a while. It's like somebody else, it's like, you know, John's Pizza Parlor or something, you know, calling you. Did you order a pizza? No, I thought this was heaven, you know, so... But that's what we, that was something that we needed in part of our history. But in the early days, I was paying attention to what God was doing up here. In fact, before we started the prayer room in the East Bay, I was asking God, do you want me to move to Roseville? Because they were humming along up here over on Riverside. They were humming along up here, and I was watching it. And I remember in my journal in 2003, I wrote down, connect with Francis. That's Pastor Francis Enfuso, who was the pastor of the Rock Church here in Roseville. And I remember I wrote that down in my journal as I was praying, God, I'm supposed to be at part of a house of prayer. I'm a senior pastor right now. I feel like I'm being called to the house of prayer. I'm going to go to Kansas City. I'm going to go to Atlanta. Maybe I'll go to Roseville. Okay, connect with Francis. It would be 14 years later that I actually connected with Pastor Francis when we were deciding to move up here. But it's interesting that in my journal why, that I wrote that. Why am I telling you that? Because there are things in your history that happened 14 years ago that are part of your story that you've got to contend for. But when we're going through day in and day out of life going, oh, life is kind of lame right now. I thought this would be different. I thought I'd be further along. I thought this would happen. We have to go back and follow the storyline of Jesus in our lives. Don't wait till you're 54. Do it now when you're 20, when you're 22, when you're 25. Look back over the last two years and track your history in God because it gives you courage to move forward. Those are the people that move forward in God. If we're just waiting for him to change the assignment for something we feel a little more excited about next month, we're not going to go anywhere in him. He's like, I've given you so much. Be a steward of what I've given to you two years ago, five years ago, six months ago. That's something I placed in your heart and in your hands. I want you to steward. In 2003, the Roseville House of Prayer started training at the Bonita campus, which is on Bonita something, Drive Avenue over here, two miles away from here, literally. What's interesting about that for me, you guys, is that when I was 15 years old, my mom and dad were leaders in that church on Bonita. And I would go and I would sit up in the, uh, what is it called? The balcony as a 15-year-old kid coming off some rough Saturday nights, if you get my drift, not serving Jesus. It's amazing to me, the storyline of God in our lives. This is redemptive. I'm running around these streets in darkness and sin, and then the Lord says, hey, I want you to start a prayer room up there. Talk about redemption. Where I'm like, hey, let's make the devil's name famous. And Jesus is like, okay, in about 25 years, we're going to make my name famous with a group of people. I had no idea that that's where it started in this little church that I would run around as a 15-year-old kid where I was learning how to drive my car and trying to figure out how to drive and all this stuff. This whole area to me, I drive around these roads and I'm like, Lord, you're redeeming this whole area. The Roseville House of Prayer, as I think about that, and and again, there's those of you that are a part of it that can speak more to the history on it. I, I know that. But there's a lot of times the Roseville House of Prayer is a biblical story in this way because God starts a thing and he calls people to build. Those that are in this room were a part of that. And he calls people to to build a thing, to run hard. The enemy can come in to do different things. God comes in to do different things. People stop for many different reasons. This thing, night and day prayer, has many obstacles to it. And if you've been doing it for any length of time at all, you realize that. That's why we need the grace of God, why I want to continue on with a few more stories here. So if you go to the next page, we're going to jump right into it. Page two. What are we looking at here? Kansas City Royals? Is that where we're at? Is that where we're at, everybody? Okay, thank you. I'm I'm looking at different notes because I've got like 10 pages in front of me. You guys got one, so... I've got notes everywhere up here that I'm just trying to make very concise so we don't spend too much time on this. But because it's so rigorous, because this thing can be difficult, because our hearts are weak in it, because we're called to this, some of us daily, we're doing it every day. 
Uh, some of us are doing it three, four times a week. We're here a couple times in the evenings. We're giving our lives to it. When we first sign up, there's a lot of inspiration and excitement, and then life begins to happen. Like I've said many times, your car breaks down. You have challenges in your finances. It's difficult to get here for uh, schedule purposes, job, things of that nature. Some of you are being called to do this as an occupation, as an intercessory missionary, and you're like, how does that work into the mix? How am I supposed to live that dynamic out? That's, are we even allowed to do that? What's that look like? That, I don't even know what's going on with that. This guy's crazy that's telling us this stuff. I don't even know if this thing's in the Bible, what we're doing, right? And I have those thoughts all the time. But then every once in a while, and it happened this morning during our, during our 10 a.m. intercession set when I was sitting over in the corner, and I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, and I said, Lord, thank you for keeping me in this for 16 years. I've looked for other things to do. I want to get the easy way out often, just like you do. We want the easy way out of stuff because our flesh hates hardness. It just does. We need just to stop negotiating with our flesh because your flesh is never going to give up. The devil does. Your flesh does not. Your flesh writhes against the discipline of God. Your flesh writhes against following God's purposes because Jesus said it, you will pick up your cross and follow me in this thing. Not just here. Whatever you decide to do with Jesus. Whether you're in this room or not. If you never decide to be here again. As long as you follow the Lord. And you're serious about it. He's going to go. Welcome to the cross. It's tailor made for you. And I'm thinking Lord you've kept me in this. And so this, this first little thing here. This Kansas City Royal story. Came to the to the house of prayer in Kansas City in 1985. And I, I just want you to hear this for a minute because it's contextual for the entire prayer movement that we're a part of. It's for this room as well as specifically for this International House of Prayer Kansas City. In 1985, the Lord spoke prophetically that he was going to speak to the prayer movement through the baseball game. That the Lord was going to speak. Whether, now, everybody stay with me. Whether you believe in this stuff or not, it's fine. Just stay with me in the story for a minute because the Lord uses many things because the Lord understands who you and I are and he speaks through parables and through us as human beings. That's prophetic. He uses these things to speak to us. In 1985, he speaks. He says, God is going to put Kansas City on the map through the baseball game. Now, you've got to remember when this was. 1985, it would be, nobody really knew where Kansas City was. You're like, Missouri, especially if you're in California, you're like, there's a place called Missouri? Right? You just didn't know. Everybody was like, oh, I know the East Coast. I know New York. I know California. But what's in the Midwest? Like, nothing? Flatlands? I mean, unless you're from there. And I, I'm not trying to say it's not important. It wasn't, it wasn't happening. And not only that, the Lord was calling of people to raise up night and day prayer in Kansas City, which has been happening for 22 years now. For 22 years, they've been doing nonstop prayer and worship in that place. And many of us know that. We realize that. But in the beginning years, it was very rigorous on them. They had 16 years of prophetic words before they would have night and day prayer. 16 years before they would have night and day prayer. And they wanted to quit. They wanted to stop. They had bad prayer meetings. Their prayer meetings didn't have worship around them. They were rock pile prayer meetings. The kind where everybody just gets in a room and yells for a while. Right? Those are, I mean, those are good prayer meetings, I guess, if, if that's your style. And I've led those before, but how many have better just been in those prayer meetings? I mean, right? You just get in there and scream. And whoever's the loudest, the devil listens to. You know, that's just how it works, right? <laughs> well, that's not really true, but you just kind of feel like that. Like, I'm just going to get loud, and, and I tend to get loud when I pray, but so you can tell I still kind of believe that, but it's not true. But anyway, they wanted to quit, and the Lord says, I'm going to put Kansas City on the map through the Kansas City Royals game. So very quickly, what does that mean? The vision was this. There was, they, were, they were in the ninth inning, and it looked like they were down and out. And the Lord, in this vision that the Lord gave this prophetic man, he says the Lord's going to send a pinch hitter in the ninth inning. And his name is Grace Grace. Grace Grace, which comes from Zechariah chapter 4. 
Grace, grace to the mountain. This is the one, this is the portion we're all familiar with. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. That's how the Lord builds a thing. That's how the Lord does a thing in your life and my life. He doesn't do things through power and might like we think he does. He does things by his spirit through grace. And that's why when you continue on in, the, in Zechariah chapter 4, Zerubbabel, the leader of the house of prayer in Zechariah 4, it's not called house of prayer, it's called temple, but they're synonymous. He says, shout grace, grace to the mountain. From mountain, you will become a plain. Mountains are challenging, aren't they? The Lord says, when you shout grace, grace to it, it will become flat. And then it goes on to speak of how the Lord's going to establish his temple or his house of prayer for his people, Israel. So the Lord says, I'm going to speak through the baseball game to this movement in Kansas City. Why is that important? Because Kansas City would be the storyteller that they have been faithful to tell this story that gives us strength to go, wow, the Lord's doing something. So let me just continue on with this. Kansas City Royals, 1985. They looked like they weren't going to make the World Series. In fact, the Kansas City Star called the World Series the Miracle World Series is what it's called. Kansas City Royals go to the ALCS American League Championship where there's seven games that are played to find out who goes into the World Series. They're playing another team, and they're down three games to one in that first series. No team comes back three, three to one usually, usually in baseball. They come back, and they win three games straight, and they beat that team to go to the World Series. They get into the World Series. They go down three games to one, 1985. The Lord speaks to this same prophetic man. He says, he gets up in a room full of 300 people and he says, the Lord's going to speak through the baseball game. He says, it's going to be an 11th hour victory. They play the game the next day and the Kansas City Royals win the last game to win the World Series. They win it 11 to zero. And the Lord says, I'm doing this to show you that I'm putting Kansas City on the map. And at that moment, the world was watching the Miracle World Series and people were paying attention to Kansas City. But the Lord was saying, what I'm doing is I'm putting this prayer movement on the map. You want to quit. It's rigorous. It's challenging. But the Lord is saying, I'm going to give an 11th hour victory to this thing. That's important for all of us because we get into our 11th hour. We're like, Lord, when are you going to break in? When are you going to break through? And the Lord says, I will do what I said I would do. I'm always going to do what I said I would do. That's what we have to understand about the Father. He says, I'm always, always going to do what I told you I would do. Do you believe that? And I often have to say, no, because it's not happening the way I want it. I don't like the circumstances. Therefore, I'm not in agreement with you. Okay, let's jump to this. S little story with me. I'm up here for two and a half years in Sacramento. We're doing prayer meetings in my house. And we start having prayer meetings at a little local church that some of you came to on Saturday nights. Now, here's what you got to know about this story that I just told. I told, I was telling this story before I, this, I was telling the Kansas City story to four people in a room on Saturday nights. Who was I telling it to? Leslie, my wife, Zach, my son, Randy Sugg. I, I don't know who else was there. Were you guys there maybe? Sometimes. Sometimes you were there. Matt was coming. Chrysla and Elijah would come in. You guys would just be like, who are these crazy people in the back just going for it? But I would stand up and tell this. I was telling these stories to seven people, maybe seven Hey, let me tell you all about the Kansas City story. My, and Leslie's looking at me like, I've heard this like 10 times. <laughs> but that's how important it, it is to me. These stories are so important because they keep me in it. I remind myself about these stories all the time because I understand what we're a part of. Because then it answers every other question. I can say no to 20 other things in my life when I have these stories in this history with God. All the other options get eliminated in my life because I'm like, no, I have these stories right here. This is what you've called me to do. 
I'm getting ready to, to quit this whole thing. We're two and a half years in. We're having prayer meetings in our house. Saturday night, we're having Saturday nights down there. I'm like, this isn't so good. It's okay, Lord. We, were, we came up here with a lot more promise. I got a phone call from Mike Grant who died and went to heaven. Come on, where's the rest of this crazy stuff? Where's all the other, where's everybody else is supposed to be coming around? And I'm like, I'm going to quit, Lord. I was grumpy. I was depressed, maybe clinically. I was, I was bad off. I am moping around the house, and Leslie's like, you better figure this thing out, buddy. She did. She said, you better figure this. She said, I'm with you. I'm with you all the way, but you got to figure this thing out. And I'm just grumpy and just moping around the house. Oh, the Lord doesn't love me very much because I got this prophetic word, and now I don't know. <laughs> and I'm like, what in the world's going on? I don't know if Jesus is really with me anymore. I mean, just think about that word. Think about that stuff. I don't know if the Lord's with me. What kind of theology is that that we're carrying? I don't know if the Lord's still with me in this thing. He's like, uh, excuse me, I am the Lord. I am with you. And everything that I told you, I'm going to do. Will you stay with me in it? During that season, after a Saturday night of me moping around, I get a voicemail. Look at your notes from Steve Eugen, a friend of mine that I hadn't talked to for 12 years from Atlanta. He says, Jim, give me a call tomorrow morning. I've got a prophetic word I think that is for you. I'm like, okay. So I call him the next day, and he says, this is the prophetic word. I was in South Carolina with my wife, and we were at this restaurant called Revival Restaurant. Revival Restaurant on East Bay Road in South Carolina. And he's like, Lord, is this for Stillwell? That's what he calls me. Is this for Stillwell? Because he, he knew that I was at East Bay when, I, when we were connected. He goes, is this for Stillwell? The Lord says, yes, call him. He says, tell Stillwell... <laughs> Tell him that revival is coming to his ministry. But also tell him this, that it's going to take a willing zero from him. And I went, a willing zero? What does that mean? Well, this is what I've, I've come to learn what a willing zero means. And it means this for all of us. Whenever God speaks something to us, we hear it and we think, I've got to give God everything I've got. Like here's, and most of the time we're only giving him like 15% if we're honest. We act like, I've given everything. He's like, no, you've given about 7%. Yeah. <laughs> That's really how it is. You've given about 7.3% if you actually need to know the math, son. But I don't even want that from you. I want zero from you. Because you need 100% of me. If you get in and give me 85% of you, it messes it all up. I just want obedience. That's what the willing zero is. The willing zero is actually realizing how proud we are that we want to give God what we think is going to get his will done. That's pride and arrogance at its core. That I've got something that's actually going to pull it off? No, I have a willing zero it's simply obedience to the heart of the Father. It's not how fiery I am. It's not even how dedicated I am or how committed I am to a thing. We bring our willing zero to him. Again, it actually doesn't even help the Lord. Because why? Because the scripture tells us that his power is made perfect in my weakness. And if we're honest... We don't like weakness, which, let me just run that out for you, that equals self-hatred. That's the root of self-hatred, not liking our weakness. So many people suffer in their bodies physically from sickness because they hate weakness, and it's really just self-hatred about how we are, whatever the thing is. And the Lord wants to free us from that. Because at the end of the day, none of us are going to go, wow, we pulled that off because we were so fiery and so dedicated. Mm -mm. Willing zero. Simple obedience. Our pride opposes God because it screams, I can do something for you, Jesus. When really he's wanting us to exchange our ashes 
our brokenness so he can make us beautiful. Matt Trask started talking to me about Nehemiah one day. We were having coffee in the midst of me wanting to quit. I don't know if you remember this. And he goes, Jim, you're like a Nehemiah. And it just hit my heart powerfully because I was like, I needed to hear that because I was like, I'm ready to pack it in. I want to stop doing this. And then the Lord began to speak to me about Nehemiah chapters 2 through 7, which is all about building the house of prayer. Basically, it's this, that if you do it, people will show up. That, that's really pretty much it. The Lord says, if you give me a willing zero, I'll take care of the rest. So I began to get faith in the midst of wanting to stop and to quit. And then I had passed the test dream. Everybody know that dream? Uh, yeah. You all know the story. I've told it before. I'm trying to take a test. I don't know the answers to this test. It was very powerful for me at the time. And here's why it was powerful. Because I was taking a test and I didn't know the answers, and it was very simple, but the teacher gave me all the answers, and every question I would go, I don't know the answer, I don't know the answer, and the teacher said, here's the answer. And when I got done, the teacher said, you passed the test, go through that doorway, and now you'll learn the information that was on the test. I thought, I've never taken a test like that in my life. And the Lord says, that's how I give tests often. I just want your willing zero. I'll give you the answers. I'm just looking for a people that will lay down their pride and their arrogance thinking they can offer me something in their dedication and their commitment. This is not about Sermon on the Mount. We have to get it straight. Let your yes be yes. That's Sermon on the Mount living. When you say yes, you do it. You show up on time. Those are your yeses. But a lot of times we get it messed up in our minds thinking all this dedication and commitment is what's going to get it done. And Jesus is saying, all I wanted was your yes. Because you're going to discover that even when you say yes, you're going to be so weak in that yes. I'm just looking for people that understand that. In every area of our life, as parents, husbands, wives, friends, employees, business owners, workers, whatever we do. This is important to me because I woke up in the morning and immediately I looked at my Bible app and it was Job 23 verses 8 through 10. And the language is that when you've gone through fire and passed the test, the Lord will approve of you. And I thought, I just had this dream of passing a test, and the Lord gives me this Bible verse. And I went, I'm in. I'm not quitting. You know what actually happened? I did quit. So the Lord could get to some of this stuff in me. He was waiting for me to quit so that I wouldn't quit. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's what he's looking for in you and I sometimes. I'm waiting for you to quit so you won't quit. Because you're trying to stay alive in the things that don't serve my purposes and don't help me. Seven-year drought. This is crazy. Those of you that went down to the East Bay with us for their, for their anniversary, you remember the night when Corey was there and Corey spoke to us at our five-year anniversary. We were 24 hours a day at the time. Corey Russell came through. This is recorded, even though Corey does not remember saying this. It's recorded. We have it on a, a CD that Amy Knight has. And Corey said, the prayer movement has been enjoying seven years of abundance, but we're going to seven years of drought. Nobody heard that word. Nobody's going to hear seven years of drought. I prophesy over you. Seven years of drought. No, we're all going to say that guy's a false prophet because we don't like that word. That doesn't agree with anything that we like. If we're honest, well, we discovered we went through a seven-year drought. Our little house of prayer moved to different locations. We were asked to leave locations. In fact, we had all of our musical equipment and everything with us that somebody bought for us. We left at one location because we went to another location and had all this equipment. And then we figured out that wasn't the place we were supposed to be. And they're like, hey, this isn't working. It's time for you guys to move on. We, we moved into another building that had no equipment at all. It was me on an acoustic guitar. I didn't even have a music stand. I had papers on the floor that I was moving around with my feet like this. Lord Jesus, we love you. Oh, how we lo love you. In the, at a 6 a.m. set. Complete weakness. Complete weakness. And the drought began. 2011. We move up here in 2017. Look at the notes here. I actually looked this up. You can, this is proven. You can look this up tonight when you go home. 
The 2011 and 2017 California drought was a persistent drought. One of the most intense droughts we've ever seen killed 102 million trees during that time. The cause of the drought is attributed to a ridge of high pressure in the Pacific Sea. But in 2017, they began to lower. And by mid-March of 2019, the California drought was declared totally over. In 2019, of August of 2019, we gathered about 100 people together to talk about this vision over at Mosaic Church. And we said, hey, we, we have the opportunity to get a building over on South Harding. And we showed everybody a funny little video of this place. And 100 people got behind us and said, yes. We showed it just like a vision night, like we just had in August. But this time, we had about 220 people last August. The first one, we had about 100 that some of you were at. And the Lord says, I'm going to provide for this. I'm going to do this with you. In August of 2019, in October of 2019, I was in this place signing a, a three-year lease on this place. And we started having meetings in here on a Thursday night. In 2020, as I said earlier, we dedicated this place as a, a house of prayer in 2020. Some of you were here for that. Many of you have come since then. Here's the point of it. The drought ended. The Lord speaks through the cosmos and the natural because sometimes our prophetic words, our dreams and visions can be a, a bit, uh, they're found to be skeptical at times, meaning they're subjective, right? Even some of the stories, like um, the phone story, like with Mike Grant calling me, you could sit in the room and go, yeah, maybe, I don't know about that. But there's no way that we can look at the signs in the natural and not see what God's doing. He says, I will speak in the natural to show you what I'm doing in the spirit. And I believe we went through that season of drought and many people in the body of Christ for those seven years, because I've talked to leaders of other ministries, experienced the same spiritual drought or wilderness in their lives from 2011 to 2017 until it was declared over in 2019. And when I saw that and actually started to study it out and look, started to look, look up this thing, I'm like, Lord, this is real. That drought is over. What, at the end of that drought, you know what happened? The East Bay Prayer Furnace got their own little building where they could have dedicated prayer. We never had that the whole time I was there. We went 24 hours a day in somebody else's church. Think about that. Think about going 24 hours a day in somebody else's church when they got Christmas musicals and Thanksgiving festivals and harvest parties and da, 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 donuts and da-da-da. Everything else is going on. Everything else in that world. And God plants this little prayer room to go, no, we're just going to sing songs back to Jesus 24 hours a day, five days a week. Will that work? Uh, okay. But when the drought was over, we got two locations that we could dedicate to prayer to the Lord. It's amazing because the drought's over. What, so what is, what, what's the point of this for this room, for your life? Is it gives us courage to move forward. When a wilderness or a drought ends in your life personally, it's easy to look back at that portion of your life and see all of that land that is parched. Because that's what happens during a drought, right? Nothing's watered. Plants die. The, the dirt is hardened. And a lot of times when we come out of wilderness seasons in our life, we think it's like, oh, the drought's over. The wilderness is over. It's all better. And the Lord says, well, it's going to require a response from you. It's not that easy that it just ended. Because a lot of times we look back at the drought and we go, how can anything grow here now? It's been so long. I've lost courage. I've lost hope. And I felt like that a little bit when we were up here. I'm like, Lord, we came up here with prophetic words, but I think I've lost courage to move forward. In fact, I told one of our board members in the years I wanted to quit, we were having a board meeting, and I walk out of the restaurant with them. I go, I don't know if I have the strength to do this. I just had to say it. And he, he looked at me, and he goes, you better find out. That's all he told me. He says, you better find out if you do. And that was, the, that was part of the process of me getting courage as I was looking at a parched ground going, can anything grow? How are you going to do this? And it was this combination of the Lord going, give me your willing zero. You pass the test. Everybody passed the test. If you do it, I'm going to send people to you. You just watch what I do because I'm going to be true to my promise. 
It's difficult for us because we come out of that wilderness season. That's why God told Joshua in chapter 1, verse 6 of Joshua's book, he says, be strong and courageous. I mean, think about those people that came out of Egypt. And, and he's telling Joshua's people, be strong and courageous. A lot of times when we hear that, we think, no, Lord, I don't have the strength to do this. I don't even have the strength to believe anymore for what you're doing because this season of drought or wilderness has been so tough on my emotions. It's been so tough on my mindsets. It's been so tough on my spiritual life, my relationships. I don't even know if I have the strength to believe you to move forward in it. That's when it takes courage to move forward. Courage comes as we tremble at the word of God. What, what does that mean for us? It means that we forget our weakness and our failure and our dedication. When we hear the word, be strong and courageous, the Lord's not always looking for us to pull up our bootstraps and go, I'll do it. He's looking for us to go, I can't do it. But being courageous means you're leaning into him, not showing off your strength. Well, here's what I learned through the wilderness. Let me have a Bible study on it. He's not looking for that. He's looking for a people that realize what they've just come out of and they're more dependent on him than they were before because he gets to that part of our hearts that we lose that pride and arrogance that says our dedication is really going to get it done. The Lord's like, I don't need that. I'm looking for a people that will receive what I've done for them. That even my weak, looking at my weakness. Anyway. I want you to hear from somebody else. Mary, where's H right now? I want you guys to come up here. This is important. Uh, and, and we're going to have some other people share in the, in the next couple of weeks as well. But I was talking with, and some of you know Horatio and Mary's story just a little bit. I'll start it. Can I just give the background on it? So, and some of you know this. Um, Horatio and Mary had a 30-year plan. I, I think you did. Zach told me that. <coughs> as Zach knows. And... Um, but you guys had a plan, you had a plan and a rhythm for your life that you were following when we first met, and we were, we were doing some things together with uh, the House of Prayer, and um, Horatio, you were getting ready to go into the CHP uh, training, and possibly moving to Southern California, and, um, but you were with us a little bit, but we were all kind of like, okay, they're only going to be here for about two or three months, and they're going to be... They're going to be heading out and um, something you guys were really planning on. It was part of the, the trajectory of your life. That's why I use the term the next 30 years because you're like, I'm going to go get established in this career for the next 30 years of our lives. And my question to you, H, and I'm asking Mary to have a question, and it has to go with this courage to move forward in a thing. What gave you the courage to realize that God was calling you to build night and day prayer. Actually, I wrote that question down. What gave you courage? Let me say it. It's, this is better. To cancel your plans. Wow. In two minutes. Two minutes. <laughs> Man, this is like a whole novel, know, and you're trying to get the spark notes. Yeah, no, it's it's true. Um, the idea of moving forward and uh, us pursuing this was always there. The whole CHP plan was to be able to have something separate that's sustained, that would provide a good income, a good retirement, all all that. But somewhere along the way, I've come to realize that. Um, Doing, going through with CHP would um, uh, take away actually more from my time that I would be able to be invested in the prayer room more than I thought that, hey, I would be able to be in this thing 24-7 or 12-7 or however much time it would have allowed me to be in the prayer room in this ministry. But then going and thinking about it and meditating, I, I just came to the conclusion that, hey, this is actually going to take more away from it than it's actually going to help benefited in the long run that was at least one part of it you know that came along with so yeah, I can I just add, um, I think to both of us you know we're 
getting older and we're adults now and we need to be responsible. Right. So what are we going to do? <laughs> so it was just this whole conversation of like, okay, you know, our hop had just ended. Our hearts had been so broken over that where it felt like, Lord, are you just done with the prayer room? We thought it's who we are. We thought it's what you've told us to do for the rest of our lives. We've given all that we had to, to this, to that prayer room. It's ended. What now? And this felt like such a logical thing. Everyone around us was with us. And it didn't feel like, like oh, if we would stop it, we were disobeying God. Nor did it feel like, I, I don't know how to say And we've had many conversations with you over this. It just felt like, makes sense. Let's just do it. And just to kind of complete over that, the more we were getting closer to that, you know, H got accepted. It was just such a done deal. Like, we got the invitation. It was literally just to start it. And the, the closer it was getting, just something was pulling on our hearts. And I think you asked me this different a little earlier because you said, what made you change your dream? But for both of us, it was like, that was not the dream ever. The dream was always this. Like, how can we be, what can we do to be in the prayer room? And this felt like a right answer for a little bit. But it, it wasn't no, it was like really. It was just like, yeah. like, wait, wait, this has been the dream all along. So, so uh, what gave you the uh, resolve or the courage to sign back up again because you're like I am not doing house of prayer again no. again many conversations like at that August first August, August vision nights again our hearts were kind of bruised by this point we're like Lord I know wherever we're going we're going to be part of the prayer room but I don't want to ever build one again <laughs> because yeah <laughs> What all of that you said earlier. And even at that vision night, Jim's coming to me. He's like, how can we get you to be an I am? How can we get you to be an intercessor missionary? And that was the last thing I wanted to hear. I'm like, dude, sure. <laughs> yeah. We'll see. We're moving, so I don't know. Um, so to answer that, it was just this thing of we say it all the time, but keep sticking around. And it was just this thing of I think my heart was just so closed off because of all my things that I was only coming here one hour a week at that point. I think this was 2020. And I'm like, I can't come before and after. There's something in me. I cannot. I'm just so broken over this, God. And then I think one time by mistake, I came half an hour earlier and they're praying. And some like I'm in the back and I'm weeping because I'm like, goodness, it's been more than 10 years at this point that I've been in and out of prayer room. And how did my heart get cold? Because this is my love. Like, this really is my love. And it became this series. And it was both for me and for H, kind of separately, but at the same time. And it became this series of, like, okay, I'm just going to come 40 minutes before my set. Just to get a little longer. And it kept increasing. And the Lord was just romancing me again with why I said yes in the first place. When I was a teenager, really, I didn't know what I'm saying yes to. And then the other thing was seeing what God was doing with your lives. Like, seeing people come in one by one and getting wrecked over this. It was just this reminder of like, the, just the sweetness of what it means to be in a prayer mode, the sweetness of what it means to partner with him, the sweetness of when the Lord begins to click it in the hearts of many. And even just to kind of witness that, it's almost like, I think of it as the one thing reality, like the, the beauty of the Lord in the hearts of other people that I'm seeing. And it was just reawakening the, it for me again. And it just, it all sort of happened. And then Jim asked me to help with like one thing, and now I'm like full time and yeah. <laughs> so. Yes. Yeah. Um, I was just thinking about um, for the past two years, I've also been doing, uh, I've picked up just doing delivery for, for a living just till we become fully funded. And last couple of days, it just dawned on me. It's like if, if I were to had gone into CHP, this would have been pretty much my life on the road for an X amount of time. Just so that, <coughs> excuse me, just so that once I'm done with that, I have the time to be in the prayer room or I have the time. But now, as I'm thinking about it, every single day that I'm on the road, all I want to do, and I keep telling me, is like, I just want to be in the prayer room. I'm just so done with this. I'm just longing for the day that I can be, we're fully funded, we can be in the prayer room 24 7. And uh, that's the one thing that all of us have is the currency of time. All of us have that. And how we choose to spend it is, uh, Really, it requires a certain wisdom and you know, a certain tug of the heart. So I just wanted to add on top of everything that's the layer of why we're doing what we're doing and choosing to be here. Yeah. So it's really just, again, just to highlight the courage. And I know there's all of us have this in our hearts in all of our lives. But I just wanted to highlight you guys tonight. And like I said, a couple weeks, I'm going to have some other people just share a little bit around this as we talk about different subjects. 
Um, so thank you both for just sharing tonight. I just wanted to get that story out a little bit. And I would encourage you to talk to Horatio Mir because they were, they were all, like, she said it. She's like, don't talk to me about anything because we're moving. And, and if I've ever asked you to do anything, it's over because then you're just, there it is. Like, don't stay away from me. But um, there, is a, there is a history with this and there's courage and there's lots of stories and you have a story in this. And maybe your story and you need courage to move on, and it doesn't even pertain to the house of prayer. But the story is the same. So I just want us to stand tonight and have the worship team come. Thank you, Horatio Mary, for just taking a minute and sharing. And, and I know as we tell these stories every week that sometimes they land and sometimes they don't land, but that's however that, however the Lord wants to do that. But I think... What the Lord's interested in from us, that we would just ask the question, <clears throat> Lord, am I uh, giving you my willing zero? Lord, as I look at, at season, a season in my life, maybe the Lord's brought you out of wilderness or drought but you're looking at the parched land and you're like I, di I just don't know if I have it to give and and you're just interpreting being strong and courageous as though you have to muster up some more strength when you don't have any and the Lord's like I just want a willing zero from you that my dedication is way more than your dedication that's what Jesus would say. That's what he says to you and I. He says, Jim, when I became weak to become human, my dedication was way more than any type of dedication that you would give to me. I simply want obedience. I just simply want your yes. 2 Corinthians 8, 9. I paraphrased it earlier but I want to read it for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich yet for your sakes he became poor that you through his poverty might become rich he became weak just like Mary said let it be according to me as, as, as your word says let it be unto me according to your word and Mary carried the Son of God. Not much she could do with that. She was filled with God, to say it that way. She was chosen by the Lord. It wasn't about her commitment at that point. She was in. She's like, Lord, here's my willing zero. Let it be in my life according to your word. So, Father, tonight I... I pray for us as a house that as we're saying yes to this Lord and in our different individual circumstances that you'd allow us to walk in courage to lean into you Lord I thank you for the story that it's grace grace that you are sending a pinch hitter up to the plate in the ninth inning when it seems like the game's over and it's grace grace to the mountain in our lives what seems like a mountain will become flat as a plane the obstacles the pressures the challenges relationally financially All these challenges, Lord, are there. We're never going to be without them. We're never going to walk this life. We're never going to walk our 80 or 90 years out apart from the challenges that this life brings us. But we can say grace, grace to the mountain in our life. Grace, grace. Knowing that what you've said about us and our lives and our history and where you're taking us, you will do it. So I ask tonight 
for confirmation in our hearts for those of us that you're setting in this room and calling whether it's to connect through internships or teams whatever it is serving this little house of prayer missions base it's got intercessory missionaries coming on and whatever we find ourselves Lord as we go into this year we've been talking about stewarding this little prayer room some 30 35 hours of worship and prayer week Lord we see it as an entrustment as a gift but I'm asking for confirmation and our and courage in our hearts tonight receive our willing zero Lord if we're offering you 25% Lord we we just repent of that we want to just bring our willing zero and say Lord we need 100% of you we need 100% of the Lord not 50% of the Lord and 50% of me. We need 100% of you, Lord. So we just make ourselves available to you tonight, right now. Let's just set our hearts before the Lord as Wendy and the worship team just lead us before the Lord right now.
for those in the room tonight that know that God is calling you to the place of courage in your life. Maybe you're walking out of a, a drought, a wilderness. Maybe a place that the Lord's just freed you from and it's a little daunting. You're like, wow, what? How can I enter into the new? It takes courage to enter into the new with God. It really does. Not because we're more committed, but I think he wants us almost to surrender that and be truly courageous. Being truly courageous by letting him be 100% to us. And if we're honest, that's a fearful place at times. I'm, I'm afraid of that some days. That's why I have plan B and plan C in my back pocket some days. Because I'm just not sure. I'm just not sure. But instead of hiding that, he's like, that's what I want to talk to you about. Why do you hide that? Why do you hide that from me? Let's talk about that. So I'm going to pray tonight for those of you that are in that spot, maybe something throughout the evening just resonated with you that you want to just receive prayer for. You're like, the Lord's calling you to the place of courage and it's, maybe you would have addressed it differently in the past. Like, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to wake up early. I'm going to go to bed late. I'm going to fast a bunch more. I'm going to go witness to 10 people. I'm going to go make sure I do this. The Lord's like, no, 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 no. season. The whole earth. And I just thank you for those that you have me running with in this hour, in this room, Lord, this people that are hungry for you. I thank you, Lord, for what you've brought us out of, what you're taking us into. Every story, every story, all of the history, all of the yeses in this room throughout the years, even with pain, where there's been pain and exhaustion, unfulfilled desires, 
that exist in this house, Lord. Here we are, wishing things were different. Wishing finances were different, relationships, family, marriages. Here we are. We offer you our willing zero. Spirit, as we just respond to you right now, I'm asking for your ministry right now. Come, Holy Spirit, across this room and release courage in our inner man right now to trust. Deliver us from ourselves. Ask him to come and release courage in your heart right now as you stand there with him. Sometimes we'll lay hands on each other. I just feel like there's a, a corporate response right now, and he's just going to minister to you as the worship team ministers and as you just talk with him. Holy Spirit, come right now. Some of you are going to feel the tangible presence of God right now because he's the one who's going to be ministering to you. It won't be a hand on a shoulder. It will be him right now. Holy Spirit, I'm asking you to rise up in your people right now. Come. Release courage. Del Deliver us from pr pride and arrogance. That our dedication, our commitment is what's going to get it done, Lord. We throw ourselves fully down at the cross, Lord. We want to be a people that are marked. Truly, it's more than a song. We live less of me and more of you. Release courage right now. Come and manifest yourself on the inside of us, Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus. Some of you are going to begin to feel the manifest presence of God as you sit before Him right now. It may come in the, in the substance of heat. You might feel fire on your inner man burning on your heart. Sometimes there's a manifestation of fire and heat on your life as the Lord's doing work in our inner man. Come release fire on our inner man that burns up the chaff that means nothing before you, Lord. The dedication of man. We want to be a people free. Truly friends of the bridegroom. strength as we wait. They will mount up with wings as eagles. Yes, Lord. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They will mount up with wings as eagles. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Our strength. They will mount up with the wings as an eagle. Renew our strength. I say they that wait upon the Lord Where there's exhaustion, I'm keeping strength. it together. They will mount up with the wings as an eagle. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount.
are you, O great mountain? You shall become like a plain with shouts of grace, grace to you. Just want you to engage for a moment. If there's a mountain in your life, I just want you to begin to speak grace, grace to it right now. Grace, grace. Scripture says, shouts of grace, grace. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Not through the power of men. Not through the might of men, but by the spirit of God. We, we see shouts of grace, grace to the mountain in our life, Lord. Grace, grace to that mountain. If you see a mountain in your life specifically, just speak grace, grace over it. It's not just saying the words alone. It's agreeing with the word of God. It's agreeing with his spirit. It's saying no to making it go away through our own strength. Grace, grace.
blood, Jesus, over us. Your blood over our emotions. Our thoughts. Father, we ask that as we've responded to you, if we've responded coming out of a season of drought or wilderness, to go into the new with you, we just ask you to seal that work tonight as we've responded to you here in this place. Strengthen us in our inner man. Strengthen our emotions by your presence. In the name of Jesus, amen. Thank you, Wendy, worship team. We're going to transition as usual into the prayer room right now as Alexa does a devotional. There'll be some movement with moving tables back in for the night watch. If you could take conversations outside, it would really help me. Thank you so much.